Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Shepherd of the Hills on this first Sunday in the season of Lent. Lent is a 40-day period in which we reflect upon the journeys of Jesus and how Jesus took our place as the perfect substitute and saved us from our sins. Today we're going to look at Jesus being tempted by the devil in the desert. And we're going to see that Jesus had to be tempted and had to overcome those temptations because you and I fail so often. Our first hymn is hymn 106. The men's choir will sing it. May God bless your worship. Thank you. 
Damascus. Be glad in the Lord and shout for joy. For as the servants of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And he was tempted just like us. 
but he never sinned. He never did anything bad. And he has to be perfect for you and for me. And then the great news is, is that Jesus went to the cross and he died for our sins in order to forgive us for all those times that we sinned, for all those times that we colored on the wall or didn't listen to mom and dad when they asked us to clean our room or, or didn't listen to them in general. Jesus forgives us all of those sins. And then he says to you and to me, I want you to go out and I want you to listen to your mom and dad because that makes me happy. And I want you to listen to your pastors and teachers because that makes me happy. And we do all of that because God is so great and powerful that we just want to do it in Thanks for coming up and testing back for the
you and I have failed numerous times to resist the temptations of the devil. But there was one who never failed, who overcame, and his name was Jesus. His victory over Satan and death are now our victory over Satan and death. We read from Romans chapter 5. St. Paul writes, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sin. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking the command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of the one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of the one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many were made righteous. This is the word of our God. The verse of the day, and we will, I forgot to take this out of the pulpit, but we will neglect the Alleluia's. During the season of Lent, uh, normally the Alleluia, it's a tradition that the Alleluia's are omitted from the service, and we kind of build them up until we get to Easter morning. The verse of the day, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him. Our gospel lesson, which will also be our sermon text, is Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. In it, I want you to see not only how Jesus uses scripture to resist the devil, but I want you to focus on how Jesus took our place in the attacks of the devil and how he overcame for you and for me. Please stand as we hear the words of our Lord. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command the angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus also answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let's join in now confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness
meditation for this morning is the Gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, in which Jesus is tempted by the devil. Dear friends of Christ, if only it was me that was there in the Garden of Eden, if only I had been there, if only God had created me first, because I would have never fallen for that trip of the devil. I mean, it was so obvious. God had given Adam and Eve only one command to follow. One. Can you imagine going to work and your boss telling you, I have one thing for you to do? Or kids going to school and the teacher saying, I only have one rule. I mean, one rule. That's all that it was. If it was me, I would have just walked away from the devil. I mean, it's a talking snake. Shouldn't that tip them off a little bit? If I had been there, it would have been different. You ever think that before? Probably. But then again, don't you and I only have one rule to follow too? One command? Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only? I mean, how hard can that be? Why do you put it like that? We're going to see today in our lesson that it, it's naive and dangerous to treat the temptations of the devil so silly, so nonchalant that I could do this. We're also going to see today that Jesus overcame the devil when he could not and did not want to, and how he won over the devil for us. It's fitting that the Bible reading for this first Sunday in Lent focuses on the temptations of the Lord. Because the scriptures say that Jesus was tested in every way that we are tested. For every temptation that the devil throws at you and me, he threw at Jesus. For 40 days in our text, Jesus was bombarded with three temptations. The old snake, that old Satan, in a way, was telling Jesus the same thing that he told Adam and Eve in the garden. Trust in me. I won't hurt you. I won't fight you. I won't kill you. Listen to me, Satan says. But our Lord did not listen. Instead, filled with the Holy Spirit, he spoke God's word and relied on God's promises, and he resisted temptation. As we begin our 40-day journey through Lent, we will learn about this temptation and how it comes to us, and we will learn how our Savior resisted. The fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, which we'll read in just less than half an hour, says, lead us not into temptation. Sounds good. But do you even know what that means? When we speak about temptation, we are talking about an enticement to evil. We're talking about lies and deception. And worst of all, we're talking about giving in to temptation. Temptation and being tempted should not be confused with the sin itself. That which tempts us may not even really be that sinful. The sin is that which is lies coiled up in grass, beyond what we can see, just waiting to strike and to take us down. How does this look? See how Satan tempts our Lord three times. He simply says, you're hungry, so make yourself some bread. He says, trust in the Lord, God will take care of you. And then he says, all of this can be yours. So the three temptations go. And the snake, the old serpent of the devil, lays waiting, coiled, and ready to bite. Let's break down each of these temptations. In the first temptation, making bread to eat is not a sin. Rather, the sin is a lack of trust in God. It is the sin of self-reliance and self-dependence. And this is where we really get fit. You think that you can take care of yourself. You think that it is your hard work that is putting bread into your mouth. You think that you can build a strong enough house to resist the many temptations the waves of this world that come and bombard against it, that you can weather the storms of life if you just 
prepare yourself enough. But really, you should trust in God to provide. Because He will always provide what we need for this life. And besides our physical needs, there's also the temptation to not trust in God for our spiritual needs. The temptation is to try to get into heaven based on who you are or what you do. Indeed, there again, God does it all for us. Because you and I can't do anything to get into heaven. Because you and I are sinners. Therefore, Jesus came died on the cross to save us from our sins, and Jesus now is the bread of eternal life. Next, Satan gets a little tricky. Trust in God, Satan says. That's not odd coming from the mouth of the devil. Trust in God? That doesn't sound that bad until we see the context. Satan tells Jesus to jump off of the temple. After all, doesn't God say that he will protect you? And don't think of this jumping off of the temple while it's just a couple of stories high, because the highest point of the temple actually overlooked the cliff. Jump off. After all, Jesus or God promises in the Psalms that he will send his angels to protect you. Is God a liar? In other words, the devil is telling Jesus to recklessly trust in God. Here, the sin is really the direct opposite of the first one. It's not a lack of trust in God. Rather, it's an irresponsible trust. Well, how does that look in our lives today? A man who lazily lies in bed all day, expecting God to provide his daily meal, is a man that's likely going to go hungry and eat. God is not a fool. And he's not to be taken as one. God has ordered that man shall work and then eat. We mock God when we exceed the speed limits of life. Whether it's like going too fast in a car or jumping on a plane without a parachute. We are trusting God and use the gifts that he has given us, including our brains. Even worse is the temptation to recklessly trust in God with our spiritual lives. Well, how does that a reckless trust in God says, it doesn't really matter what a person does. It doesn't really matter what a person believes. After all, God is going to take everyone into heaven. But scripture says that he that believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Well, how about this? For us Christians, there's even a greater temptation. It's the temptation to live as you please. Because you're going to be forgiven anyway. It's like saying, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me and for giving me the freedom to sin. That's a reckless thing to say. God's not a fool, and He's not to be taken as one. Then Satan comes with his final temptation. It's worse than the ones before. Satan tells Jesus, All the kingdoms of the world. All of the nations, every single person in them, I will give to you. I won't bother them ever again. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. Satan tempts Jesus to gain all that he could, all that he would, without going to the cross. The devil says to Jesus, why bother suffering? Like you're going to have to suffer. Why bother going to the cross? Imagine the pain you're going, it's going to be in. You can avoid all that. Why bother dying for your enemies? I'll just give them to you. Why bother sending people out to spread your message? People who are with frailties and who are sinners. Why bother with all of that? I'll just give it to you at no cost. It shouldn't cost you your life, Jesus. Bow down and worship me. Pick up the snake. I won't fight you. But glory comes with the cost. It always does. It cost our Savior his life. Because it wasn't his own glory that he was interested in, but in, the, but in your glory. That is why the 
Son of God put himself in the position of being tempted by the devil in the first place. And that's why the Son of God left the glory of heaven to come down and walk the dust of the earth with us. And that's why Jesus walked with us and ultimately became our sacrifice on the cross. He came to restore the glory that had been taken away by Satan in the Garden of Eden. On the cross, Jesus took the serpent's bite and died in our place. Well, how does this temptation apply to us? Jesus said, if anyone follows me, he must take up his cross and follow me. A part of that cross that we believe in this life means suffering and service in this life. Satan would tempt us with a false glory. He would make us think that we will not or should not suffer in this world. I mean, after all, you're a child of God, right? You're a Christian. You're here in church. You're doing what God wants. Doesn't God love you? Why would he make you suffer so much if you are truly a child of God? Satan would have you believe that in this life you should only prosper and have good fortune and have only good things to have come after you. After all, you are his son or you are his daughter. Satan would have you forget that your life here should only be lived to the glory of God and in service to God. In this world, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have suffering because you follow Christ. But the glory of this life and all the things that Satan tries to tempt us with will ultimately fade into death. However, your eternal glory comes through the cross of Jesus and in faithful service to him that springs out of faith in him alone. The temptations of Jesus are three. To not trust in God, to recklessly trust, and to think that there could be glory without the cross. All three of these temptations begin with doubt. Doubt that God will provide and protect. Doubt that, really, that God really cares how we live our lives. And doubt that God will glorify us through the cross. These are the same temptations that Jesus suffered for you. One thing is very, very sure. Temptation will come your way. I like how Mark Luther wrote about it. He said, we cannot stop the birds from flying in the air, but we can make them from making nests in our hair. So it is with temptation. We are called upon to be vigilant in our guard. The snake of Satan waits in the grass just waiting to bite it, and he whispers in your ear. Has Satan ever whisper this to you? To tempt you? To doubt that God will provide for your every need? Then tell him, one does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Does Satan ever whisper to you from the grasses to doubt that God will protect you? Tell the evil one, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Does Satan ever whisper to you to doubt that God will ultimately glorify you? That God will take you to heaven to be with him? Then tell the tempter, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. For this God has given me free and complete salvation. This God has forgiven me all of my sins. And this God has promised me a place in the resurrection, a place in heaven, a lasting glory, and a lasting place. All of this is yours right now, given to you by God. To him be the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. Please stand. May the peace of God, which transcends understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now we will join the singing of the created me on page 9.
Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the Gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Lord, we pray this morning for Anne Brady, the mother of Linda Beach, now at Barb Vicks, who is recovering from surgery. For Karen Tomford, friend of the Buick family, who was recently diagnosed with cancer. For Kathy Glover, who was admitted last night to Sparrow for some tests and observation. And for the family and friends of Carl Van Alstine and the family and friends of Mark Toller, who are grieving their loved one's loss, the loss of their loved ones. Lord, we ask that you would be with all of them. And during this season of Lent, that you would point their eyes firmly to the cross, where we have the sure hope of our salvation and the sure hope of comfort in the name of our Lord. Now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithfully to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.
ministers of the Ukrainian Lutheran Church who are Wisconsin Synod in a fellowship with. You may have seen uh, on the news, there's quite a bit out, out there, uh, of a, a nurse, an emergency doctor who was shot by a sniper through the neck. Uh, she was actually a member, or is a member, of our Lutheran Church. She is doing well now. Uh, and they, she and the bishop of the Ukrainian church are giving thanks because through that terrible incident, she has been able to share her faith in Jesus with the world. Also, please keep them in prayer, though, because we have two churches that are uh, located in the Korean Peninsula, um, and the pastors there are on purpose because it was only a couple of decades ago that the Lutheran pastors there were killed for being pastors of the churches, and so keep them in their prayers. There's been no violence in the religious atmosphere yet, and we pray that it stays that way. <clears throat> All right, a couple of announcements here. We welcome Pastor Lindloff from Emmanuel this Wednesday for our Lenten services at 7. Dinner this week is casseroles. There are still things to sign up for, so if you plan on coming and are able, please do sign up. We're doing something a little different for outreach this year. The outreach committee is asking that every time you invite a person to Easter, you put a check mark on the board outside of the narthex. So every person that you invite, and I think you'll be amazed when Easter comes around, and actually how many people we've invited, um, we'll be having some more formal invitations to hand out when we get closer to Easter. Bible discovery class begins Tuesday, March 18th, so in nine days at 7 p.m. See the bulletin for more info, invite a friend, invite a family member, come yourself, and ask questions about God. We're going to be having an outreach uh, event in spring, Saturday, April 8th, 5th. See your bulletin for more info. The Love's Priority Giving Intentions forms are due back this week. Please do fill those out so we can plan our budget. Uh, thanks to everyone with their help for the team lock-in. Teens had a good time. We had about 31 or 32 teens all together. All of the adults managed to stay awake the whole time, so that was the most impressive part. And finally, please join us in the back for some refreshments and some fellowship after the service in our fellowship hall. Any other announcements? Seeing none, I pray that you have a great day and God bless you.